The engine of the future is here. Today. The quiet one. began pioneering the application of this power plant, first to the snowmobiles, and later to outboard propulsion. In this video, I'm going to be telling you the story of the Outboard Marine Corporation, 4-Rotor Outboard. I'm making this video in part due to the lack of a documentary, and in part due to my passion for the rotary engine. This video will be based heavily on an essay written by John Sheldon, better known as Rotary John, an engineer responsible for the monster of an engine. John's full first-hand account of the engine design will be available in the description of this video. So buckle up, this is going to be a long one. The story of the engine starts over in Germany. Now, if you're watching this video, then you probably know that the rotary Wankel engine came to be during the 1920s. It was conceived by a German engineer named Felix Wankel while working for NSU, which was a small motorcycle and automobile manufacturer. His new spinning engine was thought to be the next big breakthrough for automakers at the time. NSU produced their first rotary car, the twin rotor RO80, which saw limited success and many problems. NSU eventually went bankrupt. However, many other automakers tried their hand at the rotary engine. Among these are General Motors with their four-rotor mid-engine Corvette, Mercedes with their three and four-rotor variants of the C-111, and most notably we all know who it is. in the Mazda 787B up the avenue of trees he's very quick in a race while this is all fine and great the story of the OMC engine takes us to a little town called Schweinfurt Germany this is the location of a company called Fitchell and Sachs founded in 1895 this family German company was known for producing bearings bicycles and motorcycles notably the three-speed auto in the previously mentioned NSU R080 was manufactured by Fitchell and Sachs in 1930, the Sachs Motors Division was started. At first, they produced stationary diesel and gasoline engines. They later moved on to two- and four-stroke bicycle engines, as well as lawnmower engines. What we care about, however, is their development of the world's first stationary air-cooled rotary engine. In 1960, Sachs released the KM37, a 108cc single-rotor engine. It produced 5.5 horsepower at 4,900 RPM or just under 4 horsepower if the <clears throat> extra silent muffler was fitted and let me tell you without that muffler this engine was definitely not extra silent under license from NSU Sachs went on to produce a wide range of single rotor air-cooled rotary engines for a little over a decade these included the 58cc KMS4 chainsaw engine, which came in the Sachs Dolmar, the 110cc KM3 lawnmower engine, which featured a vertical shaft and interesting ceiling design, the 160cc KM48, which was fitted to gensets and fire pumps, the 294cc KC27, which found its way into the Hercules W2000, and finally, the 303cc KM914 and 295cc KM24. These are the engines that started it all. After a licensed deal with an American company called the Curtis Wright Corporation, the KM914 and KM24 found their way into the United States. Curtis Wright was interested in air-cooled rotary engines as a possible aircraft power plant. However, Curtis Wright was not the only company interested in these small air-cooled rotary engines. Arctic Cat and Polaris, among others, purchased these off-the-shelf Sachs rotary engines. The Sachs KM914 was sold to these manufacturers in America under the Curtis Wright RC18.5 name. These companies produced a variety of sleds with the little German rotary power plants. <laughs> 
The air-cooled rotaries did surprisingly well in this application. The cold environment that snowmobiles usually operate in aided with cooling, and the smooth, high-revving engines provided an enjoyable riding experience. Enter Outboard Marine Corporation. Now let me mention that OMC had two twin branches, Evinrude and Johnson. These names will be used synonymously with OMC throughout the video. In 1964, OMC entered the rapidly expanding snowmobile market. They were struggling to compete with other high-performance companies like Arctic Cat. They needed something different. After noticing the success of the Saks rotary engine due to its light and compact package, vibration-free and quiet operation, and high horsepower and low-end torque compared to two strokes of the day, OMC knew they needed a rotary of their own. In the early 70s, Arctic Cat was selling Saks 303-powered snowmobiles faster than Saks could produce the engines. Their high-end Panther and Lynx slides were selling above market price. OMC decided that they would produce their own all-American rotary engine. Under license from NSU and Curtis Wright, OMC produced the first American-made rotary engine. Between 1970 and 71, they designed the 528cc D471 35 horsepower rotary. It was essentially the same weight and size as the Saks 303, however, through design improvements such as a surface gap spark plug and secondary intake port, it produced much more power. The OMC rotary made its first appearance in the 1973 Evinrude Trailblazer and Johnson Phantom. These sleds were the top-of-the-line models featuring many safety and luxury features. The D471 was later redesigned and sold with a claimed 45 horsepower. Here's a video of me and my friends getting one started. Unfortunately, the OMC snowmobiles never sold very well, resulting in OMC pulling from the snowmobile market in 1976 due to their high price and weight and bad marketing. Now this is where the story gets interesting. As the name suggests, Outboard Marine Corporation was in the business of outboard motors. While the company was developing the air-cooled rotary engines for their snowmobiles, work was being done behind the scenes to produce a water-cooled variant for use in an outboard. OMC was not the first to produce a rotary outboard. In 1969, the Italian company Mack produced the Mack 10, an outboard powered by the air-cooled Saks KM48 engine. The KM48 also found its way into a ski craft. Outboard Marine Corporation recognized the potential in a multi-rotor configuration as well as water cooling. This was due in part to the hot rotary sleds produced for racing. Saks produced a twin-rotor 606cc air-cooled engine. It was quite literally two 303 KM914s bolted together. It is rumored that between 6 and 20 of these engines found their way into the Arctic Cat King Cat chassis. However, they never saw production due to heat issues. Some accounts from old dealership owners state that if left idling, they would melt hoods. The race sleds featured mesh metal hoods. Team Johnson of the OMC Snowmobile Racing Team built a twin rotor race sled called the Rampage, which featured two of the 45 horsepower air-cooled snowmobile rotary engines coupled together. Drivers of the sled stated that it would melt a six foot diameter puddle underneath it while warming up. It was later banned from racing. Unfortunately, this is the point in our story where pictures and videos become a little bit harder to come by. From now on, the story is going to be told from the point of engineer John Shelton. After the air-cooled OMC rotary engines were deemed viable, development of a water-cooled version began. All components of the engine were kept the same except the housing. Instead of fins, a housing with water-cooling passages was fitted. Unlike the Mazda rotary engine, which featured cooling passages that ran parallel to the crank, the OMC engine was cooled differently. Water entered before the spark plug, ran around the housing, and exited with the exhaust. With no other changes besides the introduction of a water-cooled housing, the OMC single rotor was bumped from 45 to 55 horsepower. This gain was due to the increase in volumetric efficiency. A twin rotor version was produced, still based on the D471 dimensions, and made 110 horsepower. Both of these engines were configured for outboard use, meaning they were coupled to a lower drive end and mounted vertically. At a board of directors meeting, the twin rotor engine was mounted to a boat for demo rides. The tachometer was disconnected and the engine was left running. Everyone that got into the boat turned the key to start the engine. 
there was no noise, no motion, and no vibration. At the time, 1972, outboard racing was huge. Outboard Marine Company's biggest rival was Mercury. During the 1972 World Championship at Lake Havasu in Arizona, driver Johnny Sanders won for Team Johnson. And it was a big moment for the Johnson pit crew, who knew the meaning of that phrase, burning the midnight oil. For all of these, and for Johnny Sanders especially, Havasu was definitely the place to be Thanksgiving weekend, 1972. Although Team Johnson won, it was clear after the race that Mercury was faster, as Team Johnson won only because Mercury broke. OMC was in trouble. Both teams were running 100 cubic inch two strokes. Mercury had an inline six cylinder and OMC had a V4. The higher cylinder count Mercury engine was producing around 200 horsepower, 20 more than the OMC V4. Not much could be done to increase the power of the V4. After that race in October, the CEO of OMC at the time, Charlie String, came by to chat with George Miller. George was the head of the Rotary Engine Engineering Group at the time. He speculated with George that two of the 110 horse twin rotors from the demo boat could be stacked on top of one another. He stated, we would finally have an engine that produced over 200 horsepower and would finally have a chance to beat those black bastards, referring to Mercury's color, of course. George reluctantly agreed and informed Charlie that he lacked the manpower and could not immediately assign the project. He said it would realistically take one or two years to develop such an engine. Charlie told George to delay all other projects and claimed that racing forces development much faster than traditional engineering development. On the way out of George's office, Charlie said, Oh, by the way, I want to race them at Parker, Arizona, in March. So began what is referred to as the HSXL, Havasu Experimental Limited, and was assigned the project number D706. George assigned Mike Griffith to the program. The first issue to address was the crank, or eccentric shaft. It was decided that two twin rotor crankshafts would be used. In Mike's words, they would somehow be magically held together in the middle. This would be so that the stock D471 stationary gears and housing could be used. Mike remembered that Mercedes-Benz used a coupling in their experimental C-111 3 and 4 rotor engines. Mike also discovered that Gleason Works had a similar curvic coupling, which resembled an involute gear standing on its end. OMC was one of Gleason's work's biggest customers. After a few phone calls, a curvic coupling design was developed by Gleason that would work for this application. In the words of John, we needed the crank to think it was one piece. Because of the curvic coupling, an enormous clamping load was required to hold the two cranks together. The solution was a very special through bolt, a 7 8 inch diameter bolt made from EDT-180, a material possessing a 180,000 PSI minimum yield strength. In order to reduce vibration, the eccentric spacing of the rotors was decided to be 180 degrees instead of 90 degrees. This allowed the engine to be balanced without counterweights. Rotors 1 and 4 and 2 and 3 were in phase with one another. Because two rotors fired at the same time, the ignition from the stock twin rotor demo engine could be used. Charlie Strain came up with the idea of mounting the engine directly to the gear case. This resulted in a lower center of gravity for better turning. Thus, the engine earned the nickname of the bucket. This so-called bucket enclosure had to be waterproof and tall enough to keep water from spilling over. Stock snowmobile carbs, rotors, bearings, seals, etc. were used so that little to no new parts had to be produced. Remember, race in March. And that was that. They had the design. A snowmobile engine flywheel was cast without a counterweight, and long through bolts were manufactured to span the length of two twins. The exhaust system for the two rotor was a steel casting with deflectors turning the exhaust flow 90 degrees downward. Two of these were used on the four rotor with the housings acting as the water-cooled box around them. Designs were completed, parts were ordered, and the first engine was assembled. The engine produced 220 horsepower at 6500 RPM, acceptable for the first try but disappointing nonetheless. This was also crankshaft horsepower and the gear case absorbed approximately 15. This meant the power to the propeller wasn't much more than the V4. Pause. Bit of an interesting side note on the curvic couplings. In the words of John, they were developed by Gleason Works for early jet engines. The first outboard use of them was by Dieter Koenig in the 1950s. Charlie Strang knew that Koenig had used them. How Koenig was able to acquire such advanced technology at that time is a mystery that would be a story worth telling if it could be learned. John and Mike knew from previous work that the exhaust restriction was hindering power, and the engine was somewhat subjective to exhaust tuning. Enter John Sheldon. It is the first of the year, and they are running out of time. This is when Rotary John joined the team. 
They, John and Mike, were each working 12-hour shifts seven days a week. Illinois labor laws state that an hourly paid worker can only work 13 days in a row and then must have a day off. The law didn't apply to salaried people, so Mike and John were on 12-7. Unfortunately, Mike got sick in the first week on this schedule and ended up in the hospital. John took over both shifts. He would go home at 2 in the morning and return at 6. He started by opening up the peripheral port and enlarging the bore and venturis on the carbs. He also started the exhaust tuning. In the words of John, the dynos at OMC did not have remote controls at that time, so the operator and others, including myself, were in the dyno rooms while the engines were running. If anyone ever heard these engines run at the races, multiply that by 10, and that gives you an idea of what it was like in the dyno room. The exhaust design, which gave them the most power, was determined. Now the problem was fitting it in the bucket. Mike, feeling better, came up with the solution. The system was made from six aluminum castings welded together. The fear was that the enormous heat of the rotary exhaust would melt the castings. As a result, a second water pump was added that only cooled the exhaust system. After all of these changes, the engine made 260 horsepower at the crank. Great! Now will it last the nine hours of Parker? A fresh engine was built and mounted on a Molinari racing tunnel. They brought this boat to the OMC testing facility in Stuart, Florida, and ran up and down the Indian River above the locks. The engine performed very well and cruised in excess of 100 miles an hour, not even pushing the thing in John's words. The first day of testing concluded with no issues. About halfway through the second day, the driver flipped the boat out of a turn. The water was about 10 feet deep. The engine end sat on the bottom and the tip of the boat stuck out of the water. After assuring the driver was okay, the rotary was towed back to the trailer. The spark plugs were removed and the water was cranked out of the engine. It started back up fine and was fed oil for half an hour through the intake while idling. The next day, the 10 hours of testing were completed. Everyone felt pretty confident. Mike built two more engines for a press demo in Miami and then it was time for Parker, the first big race for the rotaries. They brought two rotary boats to Parker, an Evan Root and a Johnson. The Evan Root was driven by Jimbo McConnell and the Johnson by Tommy Posey. Parker was a run what you brung race. The rotaries were the talk of the pre-race scene. The gearbox used for the race was a 15 over 17 ratio twin pinion. This was to achieve a max top speed. Parker was a six and a half mile river. Boats would go up the river, turn around and come back. That's one lap. The race started as scheduled. There were outboards, inboards, jet boats, hydros, single engine, dual engine, and even triples. Everyone held their breath to see who would lead the first lap. And here they came. Both rotaries out front side by side with a seven liter three point hydro chasing them. In the words of John, the hydro had been clocked at 140 miles an hour the week before. Now consider that the world speed record for outboards was 136 miles an hour at the time. The driver of the Hydro had bet $1,000 he would lead the first lap and was doing everything but running upside down to try and catch the two rotaries. Jimbo and Tommy coolly drove by the crowd waving as they went. A big wave went to the Mercury camp as they flew by. Mike and John were all smiles and feeling pretty good about the long hours and work they put in. As the boats approached for the second lap, Tommy was still in first by a big margin but Jimbo was nowhere to be seen. They found out shortly that his engine had failed. Tommy continued to lead but succumbed to engine failure before the first hour was complete. They went home dejected and waited for the guys to drive the boats back from Parker. They tore the engines down and found four failed rotor bearings in each engine. After reviewing the dyno sheets, they had discovered that the engines were producing 265 horsepower on 18 gallons per hour of gas. That was better than most diesels of the time. Mike had adjusted each carb for max power and didn't believe the fuel flow meters. He went out and bought four new Cox certified flow meters and repeated the run with the same result. He didn't believe the data, but had to button up the engines to leave for Miami. Rotor bearings were replaced and although Parker didn't result the way they wanted, it scared the hell out of Mercury. Word went out from the Mercury factory that any driver who ran the Galveston race with a Mercury engine would cease to get any further factory help. They built and dyno tested four more engines for Galveston This time, they set the carbs as rich as possible before losing power. This is because the air-fuel mixture flowed through the main bearings, providing lubrication. All four engines produced around 260 horsepower. They arrived in Galveston in the midst of a tropical storm. Good sense would have called the race, but the rotaries were such a big deal it went on. Most of the Mercury drivers didn't show up, and certainly the Mercury factory team wasn't there. The race went on, and the rotaries took first, second, third, and fourth. Based on the results of Parker and the hours of testing, Mike and John determined that the props the drivers were picking were causing the engines to far exceed their 7,000 RPM redline. The drivers complained about slow acceleration out of corners with the 15 over 17 gear case, 
and put smaller props on to improve it. They took the engines home and tore them down to refresh before the next race. And man, that was going to be the race. John and Mike found out that Mercury was bringing everything they had, including dual engine rigs. They flew in European drivers in the latest Molinari boats. OMC showed up in Provo several days early. They had to rejet all of the carbs because of the 4300 foot elevation. OMC had four engines at Provo and was ready. It was a three hour race on a three mile oval, three pin course. For the first time, OMC used the bigger 14 over 23 ratio gear case. It was slightly slower on the top end, but greatly helped acceleration. The bigger propeller also gave better control of the boat. The race started and the rotaries led 1, 2, 3, 4 on the first lap. Within 15 minutes, the rotaries had lapped the first Mercury boat. The OMC drivers got a huge kick out of pulling up next to their Mercury rivals, giving them a little wave, and then wide opening and powering away. This was also the start of a legendary rotary racing driver team. Jumbo McConnell, number 191, and Barry Woods, number 35, were drivers for Evinrude. And Tommy Posey, number 197, and Johnny Sanders, number 196, for Team Johnson. Two of the four engines broke before the end of the race, but the other two took first and second. Mercury was so pissed, their plane left before the race was half over, having to take off over the race course. After the race, OMC began tearing down the engines. The cranks cost $10,000 a piece at the time and seemed to have a design life of 25 hours. To try and improve the life, the crank bearings were ground and resurfaced with stellite. The failures at Provo were due to that 7 8 inch bolt we talked about earlier that held the cranks together. It snapped. This would be the first of many of these kinds of failures. Side story from John. One of these failures occurred on the dyno. The bolt snapped, sending it through the ceiling of the dyno room. The ignition for the engine was on the top two rotor, but the power takeoff was on the bottom two rotor. When the bolt breaks, the top engine goes into no load and the bottom engine coupled to the dyno stops. Because the engine was balanced as a four rotor, when this happened, the top engine lost its dynamic balance and broke off the dyno. Here it was hanging from the throttle cables, running no load, shaking all over the place. One of the technicians saw this and headed to the door post haste. Unfortunately, I was between him and the door. Ever have a 250 pound guy run you over? I got up and threw the throttles back to idle and fortunately the engine quit. No one got hurt, but there were several guys changing their underwear. They attempted to determine what was causing these bolt braking failures. They discovered a natural frequency resonance at 7000 RPM in the crank right at the operating speed of the race engines. They ended up using a special silver plated tapered washer under the bolt nut to lessen the stress on the first several threads of the bolt. This eliminated the bolt breaking at the top, but the failures continued at the bottom thread. They tried various dampeners on the bolt, but nothing eliminated it completely. After the Provo race, Mercury, who ran American Power Boat Association at the time, tried to ban the rotary from further competitions. OMC ran four engines in Carroll Springs, more or less as an exhibition, as it wasn't a major race on the circuit and Mercury didn't care if they ran or not. The engines finished 1, 2, 3, and 4, but there was no real competition. The next major race was the Six Hours of Paris. This was also the first race where both OMC and Mercury brought their V6s. OMC actually made two V6s just for this race. Cranks were made from V4 cranks welded together, sandcast blocks and heads were made, but the rest of the parts were straight from the V4 racing engines. Johnny Sanders won this race with one of the homemade V6s. OMC brought four rotaries to this race and Mercury brought their V6s. This was the first head-to-head race for these engines. Johnny Sanders' engine broke, the rotary, during practice. Broken crank bolt. The Mercury driver, Johnny, had just passed, said later that he saw something fly 50 feet in the air as Johnny broke. It was the bolt. Mercury asked OMC to go halves on a tanker truck of aviation gas, but because the rotaries could run on 87 octane, Jack Leak of OMC said he wasn't interested. The race went on, with two of the remaining engines breaking before the finish, but while they were running they were ahead of the Mercury's. Mike Downard was the sole remaining rotary, and he took it easy to try and save the engine. Mercury took the lead back for a short time, but succumbed to engine failure on their V6. Mike won the race for Evinrood. Charlie Strang got a hold of John and said he wanted to see him and George Miller in his office the minute we returned to the States. The Johnson distributor in South Africa requested that OMC bring the rotaries to his race. It meant leaving the last week before Christmas and returning after the first of the year. This was the only race that John didn't attend with rotaries running.
Johnny Sanders went with one Johnson, winning the race easily. The only competition was old OMC V4s and Mercury inline sixes. That ended the 1973 racing season. In February of 1974, the Iranian gas crisis hit the country and gasoline went from 30 cents a gallon to 75 cents a gallon of 100 octane if you could get it. It was felt politically that racing would not project a good corporate image when people were waiting in line for hours to get gas, so the racing circuit was put on hold. Development of the engine continued in-house. The compression ratio was increased from 8.5 to 1 to 10 to 1. Transfer passengers were enlarged, and work started on a design of a true four-rotor engine, not just two twins stacked on top of one another. This meant three curved couplings and three center housings. They also designed a turn buckle, which was a left and right threads, to hold each curved coupling together. This eliminated the long 7 8 inch through bolt, which was still breaking. By eliminating the large center section in the crank, common to twin rotor engines, they were able to add a center main bearing, strengthening the entire assembly and reducing weight. Power increased to 265 horsepower at the propeller, not just the crank, at 7,000 RPM. They also installed ignition limiters, limiting max engine RPM to 7,000. In testing, you could hear the drivers running on the limiter most of the straightaways. This decision didn't last too long, as they were afraid of the engine damage that might result from the high speed missing and the drivers hated the limiters. The first race in 1974 for the rotaries was the Six Hours of Paris. Mercury had succeeded in banning the rotaries from final scoring, but on threat of pulling all OMC engines from the race, the race officials allowed them to run exhibition only. Four engines started the race and easily dominated, leading by as much as 15 minutes. One boat barrel rolled in a corner, one boat hit the turn buoy, which was made out of concrete, and took the side of the boat off. One succumbed to engine failure, and the fourth was leading by 30 minutes, with 15 left in the race when the engine failed. Upon inspection after the race, it was found someone had sabotaged the engines by loosening all eight carburetor nuts. With the carbs not tight to the intake manifold, severe air leaks caused a very lean mixture resulting in rotor bearing failure. The fact that it lasted as long as it did was amazing. This was the race that Caesar Scotty was killed, or more correctly let die by the French police. Scotty had hooked a sponsoon which threw him into the concrete wall of the river. He was thrown through the front of the boat and up against the retaining fence. A U.S. doctor tried to help him, but French police would not let, let him touch Scotty. It took 45 minutes for the French to cut down the retaining fence and get him to the hospital. He pled to death internally before he got there. Because of Scotty's death, the rest of the European circuit was cancelled and everyone was sent home. This was the only race for the 1974 season. Development continued trying 100% alcohol and nitrous oxide assist. The nitrous oxide gave a 30% power increase with the push of a button. The alcohol did not do much for power, so it was abandoned. Engines were consistently producing an excess of 280 propeller shaft horsepower at 8,000 RPM without the nitrous. This next race was Mercury's premier race, as this was Billy Seabold country, and was billed as the World Championship. The race consisted of four 20-minute heats, with a Le Mans-type start for each heat, the winner being determined by total points for each heat. OMC brought four rotaries and four V6s to the race. All were equipped with nitrous bottles. The rotaries being charge-cooled, meaning the air-fuel mixture cooled the internal parts, lost approximately 30% of its airflow, or volumetric efficiency, as it heated up to its operating temperature. Because of this, OMC devised an external battery-operated water pump and pumped lake water through the cooling system during each heat of the race to try and cool the engines back down again to regain horsepower for the start of the next heat. Each boat had a crew assigned to carry the pump and battery to pump water through the engine between each heat. As said, this was Mercury's race, and as such they created their own rules which OMC did not know about until race time. First, Mercury insisted on qualifying runs. Each boat ran several laps for time and the top 10 times qualified for the race. Mercury had been at the race site for two weeks, setting up their rigs for this race, and as such had their equipment tweaked for the race. The time trials resulted in the four rotaries and six Mercury V6s qualifying for the race, no OMC V6s. Mercury then assigned one Mercury driver to each rotary boat, and they were told to block and run them wide in the turns, 
This allowed two Mercury boats to run uncontested for the win. Mercury added radios on their boats for this race, and during the race, all you heard was, hold your position and don't let so-and-so inside of you. The OMC drivers were told to use the nitrous only for acceleration out of the corners, as each bottle only lasted 20 minutes and there was no opportunity to change bottles once the heats had started. Unfortunately, the drivers didn't pay much attention to this, and at the start of the first heat, you could see nitrous fumes coming from the air slots in the bucket. The face turned ugly from the get-go. Tommy Posey's boat was destroyed when a Mercury driver tried to keep him from going inside and hit him. Mercury denied a protest. Barry Woods and an Evinrude Rotary won the first two heats, but Mercury team drivers effectively blocked Johnny Sanders and Jimbo McConnell. The blocking continued in the third heat, with Molinari assigned to Barry for that heat. He effectively blocked him until Barry got pissed and ran over Molinari's boat, leaving prop cuts out along the entire side of Molinari's boat. Mercury disqualified him from the heat for reckless driving, even though he won. That left the race with two heat wins for Woods and one win and two seconds for Seabold. The fourth and final heat was intense. Woods led from the start, but Barrel rolled his bolt in a turn. The boat rolled one complete turn and ended right side up. Barry was thrown out of the boat, but swam back to his boat, restarted the engine, and went on to win the heat, and thus the race, or so he thought. When Barry rolled his boat, the top shroud of the boat came off and sank. Barry's numbers were painted on the shroud, and without it, he didn't have his numbers on his boat. Mercury disqualified him, as the APBA rules state, you must have your numbers on the boat, and thus claim the victory for the race. It was a huge disappointment for OMC, and particularly Barry Woods, because he actually won all four heats, but was denied the win because of politics. It became apparent from this race that Mercury would do anything to claim a win. And if this was the type of racing that would continue, someone was going to end up seriously hurt or worse, killed. The only other race the Rotaries entered was Pewaukee, Wisconsin. Jack Leak insisted the Rotaries run the high speed 15 over 17 ratio gear cases on all four Rotaries, even though the OMC V66 ran the 14 over 23 ratio gear cases. The Rotaries were faster at the end of the straightaways, but the OMC V6s out accelerated them out of the corners. It was John's belief that this was done to showcase the V6s as they were scheduled for production and wanted to appear faster than the rotaries. The Mercury Factory V6s didn't show up for this race, only the old inline 6s, and as such it was an easy win for the OMC V6s. By 1975, the EPA was making noises about regulating emissions on outboards. They were in fact doing lake testing in Michigan and Florida, trying to prove outboard emissions harmed water quality and aquatic life. In addition, in 1974, the state of California banned any two-cycle motorcycles from public streets. No emission standard, just a total ban. A rotary is actually a four-cycle engine, even though the charge-cooled versions mixed oil with the gas to lubricate the internal parts. An untreated rotary emitted ten times less hydrocarbon emissions than the two-stroke equivalent at the time, according to OMC. OMC was afraid, however, if they introduced a production rotary outboard, the EPA would impose a similar ban on two-stroke outboards. OMC was in no position to replace their entire lineup of outboards with rotaries. Not only had they only limited horsepower size of engines under development, the cost to retool the entire lineup would have been prohibitive. Because of this, the rotary program was put on back burner, and development emphasis was put on two cycles. The rotary group started to fall apart with the departure of several key engineering people, including George Miller and John Sheldon himself. Before John left OMC, four more racing rotaries were built, dyno run, and put into storage. Very little further development work was done on the rotaries after 1976. When BRP bought Johnson and Evernrood from the bankrupt OMC, the deal did not include any rotary technology or rights. In fact, OMC had sold all of their remaining rotary assets, including parts inventory and machinery, to Paul Muller of Muller International. In the end, there were a total of six complete race engines, plus a ton of spare parts. The six were defined by the shroud, the bucket, and the exhaust manifold. Two units are in a private collection, one unit is on display at BRP, and one unit just went on the 100th Evinrude Anon Tour. This leaves one more complete unit somewhere. Supposedly, all the OMC race hardware was scrapped when BRP took over. This includes the V4, V6, V8, and rotary. Recently, an OMC rotary engine bucket and shroud sold on eBay. However, it was just the show-and-tell model hung in the lobby on the OMC engineering building.
It was not fully machined and didn't have an engine in it. OMC went on to develop a V8 to dominate the unlimited outboard class, and Mercury created a class that only their V6s could compete in, and so ended one of the most exciting and talked about periods in outboard racing history. The highest horsepower dyno run for the rotary with no nitrous and 87 octane resulted in 313 horsepower at 10,600 RPM at the propeller and 213 foot-pounds of torque at 5,000 RPM at the propeller. I am also told that the four-rotor race engines emitted 10 times less than all other two-stroke racing outboards of the day. So in the end, what happened? What happened to this class of rotaries? While Saks is still around making shocks and other automotive products, the motorworks division is long defunct. Saks pulled the plug on the rotary division just as they were beginning to rework the 606 twin for better cooling. Saks rotary research was sold to Norton, the British bike company, and they, under David Garside, developed the twin rotor air-cooled Norton RCW588 motorcycle. It shared internal dimensions with the Saks KM914, the 303 that came in Arctic Cat sleds. After a long quiet period from the British, the Crichton CR700W was just announced in 2021. Brian Crichton, an engineer who worked on the Norton rotary bike in the 80s, is releasing a new twin rotor motorcycle. Only 25 of these bikes will be produced. The new twin rotor produces 220 horsepower at 10,500 RPM and just 690 cc of displacement. The OMC rotary technology was purchased by Paul Moeller. He owns all of the OMC drawings and machinery. Paul has spent over $40 million over the last 25 to 30 years further developing the basic single rotor OMC engine, along with prototyping several other new displacements. Paul of Muller International started a company called Freedom Motors and rebranded the OMC rotary line as Rotopower. More details can be found on the current website. He now has a water-cooled version of the single rotor engine producing in excess of 80 horsepower and it meets the California emissions requirements. In an email from John Sheldon, he states that We had put rotaries in everything from golf carts to chainsaws to snowmobiles, inboards and outboards. There is so much the world doesn't know about OMC's rotary program and how far advanced OMC was on rotary technology at the time. They were eons ahead of Wankel, GMBH, Mazda, and anyone else for that matter. The U.S. Department of Defense was even interested in the OMC four-rotor power plant. At 300 horsepower and 137 pounds, there was no other power plant in the world at the time with that power-to-weight ratio. As an engineering student myself, I can only imagine how cool it must have been to be a part of the OMZ rotary program, which started as a promising endeavor, sort of tapered off. I can't help but imagine that a four-rotor would fit in quite nicely in our current outboard market. While all other industries seem to be looking for smaller alternatives, the outboard market more and more proves that there is no replacement for a displacement, with V8s dominating the market and Mercury releasing a 7.6 liter V12 in 2021. Could the rotaries ever make a comeback? We'll just have to wait and see what the future holds. If you look in the description of this video, you'll see that there are many sources, SAE papers, videos, and uh, websites that I came across in making this video. If you're interested in anything that you heard in the video, I would recommend uh, taking a look at those. Thanks for watching.